Well, welcome to another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. My name is Mark Powell. My special guest with me this morning is Senator Eric Abetz uh, from Tasmania. Today we're going to be talking about all things to do with mandatory vaccination uh, as well as the Religious Freedom Bill. Senator Abetz, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Um, Senator, you have been, you are a, a Christian as part of the Reform Church. Um, can you tell us a little bit, I think you're also the second longest senator uh, in Australian history. Uh, when did you begin and also what has, has motivated you to remain for so long in the Australian Parliament? Mark, thanks a lot for having me and it's good to be able to talk with you and uh, your viewers Uh, I got into the Senate in 1994, so as we speak, I've been there for 27 years and uh, it's been a real privilege to be able to serve and uh, it's been my uh, motivation to be of service and as a result, I gave up what some might describe as a fairly successful legal practice. I took a pay cut to get into politics and... uh, my darling wife at the time, I'm a widower, uh, she backed me in on that and was willing to undertake the role of mainly bringing up the children, running the household to free me up to uh, become a minister in the Howard government, then deputy leader of the opposition in the Senate, leader of the opposition in the Senate, which in opposition is elected and then Tony Abbott appointed me as uh, leader of the government in the Senate, and then I became defrocked when uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, had his palace coup. And a lot of people asked me at that time, Eric, why don't you leave? And my view was, yep, my parliamentary pension would pay handsomely and I could go back to the law, it would be a good lifestyle, but my darling wife in the latter stages of her illness uh, said, look, Eric, stick with it. Uh, You got in it to be of service, and that is what I seek to continue to do. And being unshackled from the front benchmark does allow you to speak your mind so much more freely. So out of my 27 years, I spent, I think, about 17, 18 years on the front bench. And so the last, what, six years or so, I've had the freedom to speak out on a whole host of issues, including, of course, uh, those that are seeking to impose mandatory vaccination. Yeah, I want to get to that because that's the really the hot topic of today. And it seems like we've had worse pandemics before with smallpox and, and, and uh, lots of other um, very serious illnesses. Why do you think there's such a push today for mandatory vaccination? We, I don't think we've ever had that before. I think, uh, yeah, with respect to uh, the leaders all around Australia, there has been a disregard for individual choice and individual freedom. And look, for the record, I'm vaccinated. If anybody were to ask me, I would say, yep, I think it's worth taking the risk to be vaccinated. Are there possible side effects? Yes, there are, but there are also side effects if you don't take the vaccine and you you catch COVID. But men and women of good faith and good reasoning can come to different conclusions. So, yeah, it's not uncommon, Mark, for example, the high using as an example, seven men and women of high intelligence, high competence, uh, they take the same oath of office, they hear the same evidence and apply the same law, and guess what they do? They come up with split decisions, sometimes 4-3, which proves to me that men and women of good faith and competence looking at exactly the same evidence can come to different conclusions. And we ought to live with that, accept that, and tolerate that. And uh, just because somebody might be in a minority doesn't mean that you just uh, say, well, you're in a minority, you have to do what we say. Because one of these days, those that are asserting that dominance have to acknowledge they might one day be in a minority. And another example I use is that a true democracy is not mob rule. So, you know, three wolves and a sheep. 
voting on what's for lunch is not democracy. The sheep might say that's not quite fair. And uh, similarly, in our democracy, we have to tolerate and live with the minority. And from time to time, it stands to reason, we'll be in the majority and in the minority. But what is um, behind this nearly manic uh, mandatory uh, uh, vaccination, I don't know, other than the officials do believe that the higher the vac vaccination rate, the uh, better the public health outcome. Yeah, I want to pick up on that because I think I share the same exact same personal conviction as you. I've been vaccinated. My wife's been vaccinated. I don't think either of us have ever refused a vaccination. But I've even noticed this within the church. There is such a concern for public health and it would be put under the, the rubric or the paradigm of love of neighbour that we should all get vaccinated um, for the, the health of the wider community and that if everybody got vaccinated, then we'd, we'd have a problem, that we would have no problem. How would you respond to that argument coming out of, I guess, genuine concern for the health uh, and well-being of our fellow citizens? I'm one of these people that tries to boil things down or distill things down, mm. and I've got a funny feeling that heaven will be available for the vaxxed and the unvaxxed, and uh, we will be uh, seeing each other up there. So, uh, yeah, as to one's salvation, etc., being vaccinated, unvaccinated, to me is not an issue. I can understand there are strong feelings on both sides and I can understand the motivation of those that genuinely believe they'll be doing something for uh, the rest of the community. Um, I sat down with a pastor, local pastor some time ago, who was dealing with this issue because there were some in the congregation saying, I don't want to meet with unvaxxed people of a Sunday morning. And, of course, my response to that was, since when is the church not allowed, in inverted commas, lepers into uh, into the church? And I dare say unvaccinated people, and I hope I haven't offended anybody by using that analogy, um, yeah, should not be considered to be in that category. But, look, uh, I can understand that motivation. A lot of people, Mark, would argue that the vaccination, in fact, does not protect others it protects you and in fact that's why i took the vaccination because i think on the evidence if i'm vaccinated when i catch covid because there is every likelihood i will i will be impacted less therefore there's less likelihood of me ending up in hospital and even better for the short term less likelihood of me ending up in the cemetery and uh, that is the basis that i think that makes good sense. But the evidence seems to suggest now that even if you're vaccinated and you catch COVID, you may well carry a viral load equivalent to the unvaccinated within about three months of you having been vaccinated. So in all those circumstances, there are good arguments on both sides and we should just learn to live with each other and uh, accept. And look, if the vaccination does what it says it does, why should I as a vaccinated person be fearful of an unvaccinated person sitting next to me? I, I actually don't get that argument. So, uh, look, I can understand people are well motivated, but uh, I am just as willing to accept that those that don't want to be vaccinated have exactly the same motivation of looking after their body not wanting to have something injected into it which they think is foreign and shouldn't be. I don't happen to agree with them, but you've got to accept their argument and accept that they're putting that in good faith. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think there was a very, very famous um, pastor in the in the same tradition as you in the Reformed um, uh, denomination, uh, Abraham Kuyper, uh, who went on to be the Prime Minister uh, of the Netherlands, who argues very strongly, even though he said vaccines were a, a good... Uh, an ethical thing for uh, Christians uh, as well as the general society to use. He was dead against uh, mandatory vaccination for a lot of the same reasons uh, that you give. Um, I wonder if 
this really does fall under um, the biblical framework of Romans 14 and 15 about freedom of conscience uh, and about showing true tolerance. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm So in New South Wales, we've had, so, and in Victoria it's even worse, we've had some very draconian le- legislation uh, forbidding people, well, there was a time where churches shut down for a number of months. Um, even when we came back, uh, there was restrictions on singing. Um, a little bit of a delicate question. Uh, Tasmania has been basically COVID-free. Um, how do you think it's going to play out when, uh, I know you've got high vaccination rates, but what do you think is going to be the response of the Tasmanian government um, when it finally does get to be an outbreak? That's a very good question. Uh, The Tasmanian government has been nearly in lockstep with the other states in relation to restrictions and uh, mandating vaccination for certain uh, public employees. And I must say, um, I do have issues with that. But uh, Tasmania in particular has an older age cohort and regrettably worse comorbidities such as obesity, um, um, heart disease, etc. And therefore, our population is potentially more vulnerable. Therefore, I think the government will be more sensitive in relation to uh, opening up. My own view is that, uh, to put it in a nutshell, you cannot stop living because you're scared of dying. Yeah. And uh, we, we have to get on with it. My view has always been that if the best protection is vaccination, then as soon as everyone that wants to avail themselves of vaccination have had a reasonable opportunity to be so vaccinated, that is when you get rid of the QR codes, open up the borders and say, we cannot continue to live like we have been living. One, from a mental health point of view, hugely impactful that a lot of the media don't want to talk about, whereas before COVID, mental health was the flavour and everything was mental health. Now it's been discarded in favour of COVID, but I think after COVID's over, there'll be a huge mental health um, uh, revelation. And then as well, there is the huge economic costs where our children and grandchildren will be paying off this huge debt. Mm. And that is where I think in the public policy mix, Mark, what we need are leaders who don't just stand there with their chief medical officer and sort of virtually acting as the the, uh, uh, ventriloquist doll of the chief medical officer. They need to take in the advice of the chief medical officer, take in the advice of the mental health advisors, take in the advice of the economists, stir it all up, and then come up with a policy which balances a lot of these things out. I, I use the road uh, road safety as an analogy. If you only, as a leader, took the advice from your road safety officers, mm. we'd have a speed limit of, what, 40 kilometres an hour. But we say the road toll, while we, want, while we want it at zero, we are willing to run a society that accepts that, regrettably, there will be an unfortunate road toll and injuries, but we've got a logistics task of moving goods to and fro. We also want the convenience of being able to get from point A to point B relatively quickly and efficiently, and therefore we set the speed limit at 100 or 110. And that's the sort of balancing that I think is lacking in our COVID response. Yeah, I think that's really well said. There's always got to be a balance, doesn't there, between duty of care and dignity of risk. And it just seems like we've just weighted it so much on the other side. Can I pick up on one thing which I I know is very close to the heart of a a number of Christians that I've spoken to, and that is, and and I know you feel very strongly about this, and I'd like to hear your thoughts more on this, um, mandatory vaccination for certain professions. Um, What... What can be the appropriate response as Christians, as good citizens, to what Christians feel like in this um, category is a, is an unjust or unfair law? What would you recommend? What's the way forward? Well, look, um, yeah, as Christians, we accept what the law of the land is, 
unless it is a complete uh, denial of our Christian faith. And therefore, if there is a, a consequence of job loss, uh, I'm not sure that harsh, terrible, and I oppose it, but I'm not sure it would be um, of such gravity to say that this is a fundamental denial of my Christian faith. But, you know, we have silly situations, Mark, uh, one that I'm aware of, a single mother, she's an assistant teacher, three children, needed the job to help pay the house mortgage and look after the kids. She didn't want to be vaccinated, so she's lost her job. However, her three children go to exactly the same school where she was an assistant teacher, and she's allowed in the front door as a mother and into the classroom, parent help, etc., etc. Yeah. And so you then ask, excuse me, where is the public health imperative of the double vaccination for this assistant teacher? And it's this cookie cutter approach, this manic approach, um, which doesn't bear up to scrutiny. Look, if a medical authority were to say, if you're a nurse or a doctor practicing in the intensive care unit, for example, we would like you to be vaccinated and then have a booster uh, on a regular basis so that the likelihood of you passing on COVID is lessened. I can sort of understand that as being part of the job. But, yeah, we've had another example where a GP in Tasmania is, not, is now no longer allowed to practice as of the 31st of October, who she won't take the jab, but... She's not even allowed to practice telehealth. Sitting in an office by herself on the telephone talking to people, mm. she is not allowed to. Why? There is just no uh, common sense being applied. And so I understand the frustrations of many people, Christian and non-Christian. But I say to those of the Christian faith that ultimately these things in your individual lives and indeed the life of the nation is in God's hands. Is there anything, though, in, a, in terms of a response in a godly way, in a democracy, uh, that, I mean, what, uh, people feel frustrated, uh, they feel aggrieved. Uh, I, I know people that have had to stop their medical degrees um, uh, mm. because they have refused to be vaccinated on conscientious grounds. Um, is there um, any way that, they can constructively um, appeal these kinds of governmental, I think, overreach decisions. Yeah, look, in our democracy, there have been the freedom rallies, and if they are peaceful, well-organised, then, of course, front up to show the strength of community feeling in relation to the mandatory nature of vaccination and the desire for freedom, uh, make representations to your federal and state parliamentarians, write letters to the editor and be active within your community on social media, pointing out uh, the inconsistencies and, might I add, the inappropriateness. And it's amazing how the mainstream media have not been genuinely reporting on the freedom rallies, mm. or are they willing to talk about what the Australian Immunisation Handbook has told us now, as I understand it, for decades, and that is that immunisation should only be administered with legal valid consent or valid legal consent, which means no undue influence, no coercion, no manipulation. Well, I'm sorry, but if you are being told by a government that you as a teacher or an, an assistant teacher are going to lose your job unless vaccinated, I think most fair-minded people would say that is undue influence, if not outright coercion. And uh, why is the Australian Immunisation Handbook, which has been the Bible in this area for so long, just discarded for this particular um, um, illness? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I think there are some very real issues here that will need to be addressed for the future to ensure that we don't go down this road again. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, if I, now, you've been in Parliament for 27 years. Um, you would have seen a lot of change 
um, not just in the parliament but in society in that time. Um, there's a religious freedom bill um, that's currently before the parliament. How I'd like to hear your personal view here on this. How um, how important do you think this bill is? A and B. How effective do you think it will be um, in protecting religious freedom in this country? Look, very good questions. Yes, an important bill. How effective will it be remains to be seen. I would like it to be a lot uh, strengthened a lot more. But look, Mark, can I start off with my losing argument that I like to put whenever I possibly can, and it's never been taken up, but so forgive me uh, this in, and thank you for the indulgence, but my view has always been that freedom of speech and freedom of association ought to be the two bedrocks of a liberal democratic society in which we live. And if we had true freedom of speech and true freedom of association, we wouldn't even have to worry about religious freedom because religious freedom would be a subset of freedom of speech and freedom of association. I've lost that argument, and so we are now dealing with the issue of uh, uh, religion. And what has happened over time, and this is where I think the courts have let us down as well, we have these international treaties under which the federal government now clothes itself with the authority to legislate in a whole range of areas of discrimination. But the discrimination and uh, uh, universal charters are, if you like, a complete body of work and talks about all sorts of freedoms and rights and obligations whatever. And what successive governments have done, they've just cherry-picked and said, oh, today we'll legislate on sex discrimination, another day on age discrimination. And of course, when you do that, you don't get the whole picture. And the common law in the United Kingdom that we inherited in Australia provided those fundamental freedoms, which are just so important in the common law, they were given. But now that we've been going down this path of legislating piecemeal, one freedom, one right, be it, you know, sex, age, disability, race, whatever, well, now it's the turn of religion. And the Australian Human Rights Commission has acknowledged that in the suite of legislation that we have in relation to discrimination, there is a glaring hole, and that is religious freedom. So clear need for it. I personally would prefer the guarantee of speech and association, and in those circumstances, religion would be covered. Why is it so necessary? In my home state of Tasmania, and I'm pleased that Tasmanian legislation will be overridden in this regard, had the Archbishop of Tasmania dragged before a state government authority to explain himself as to why uh, his teaching on marriage was not offensive under the legislation. And all he did was hand out to the Catholic school community, so to the Catholic flock, those that had voluntarily signed up to Catholic schooling, the teaching of the Catholic Church, signed off by each and every archbishop in Australia. So it was a common statement from the whole church as to what the Catholic Church believed marriage was. And might I add, at that time, it represented the law of the land. And here he was, dragged off, uh, just for that purpose. That is completely and utterly unacceptable, and that is where we need, um, I think, some uh, recalibration, and this is what this legislation will seek to do. That said, the Israel Folau Clause, as it's referred to, has not been uh, included in the legislation, and my view is that you know, if somebody like Israel Folau and people can talk about the sensitivity of what he said and how he said it, etc. But at the end of the day, if you don't believe in hell anyway, why would you be concerned or offended if you were a drunk or 
any one of the other categories to which you refer to. Uh, it had no impact on his play, playing of rugby, and I suspect that uh, none of the uh, spectators would have been upset either. Yeah, look, I, I agree. That's, that's one, yeah, one great example as to why we need it. Um, I've been really concerned about Daniel Andrews and the overreach that his government has had, not just with mandatory vaccination, um, but also with his gay conversion bill, which will seek to prosecute people not just in Victoria, but in other states who even pray for somebody um, about changing their sexual orientation or desires, even if that person requested it. Uh, will the Religious Freedom Bill protect people from that kind of prosecution, Eric? Mark, that's a very good question. It should do, and I trust it does, and uh, I would have to have a look at it. But uh, what you say is absolutely right with Dan Andrews, Bill, from what I've been told is if somebody in Victoria were to ring me in my electorate office in Tasmania and say, look, Eric, I understand you're a Christian. I'm battling with my uh, sexuality. Would you pray for me? Mm. And so I then pray. Next time I'm in Victoria, I could be arrested by the Victorian police. This is just outrageous yeah. um, in in anybody's language. And look, uh, you know, people do grapple with their sexuality, with their identity. I remember just not all that long ago, talking to a young fellow, age 25, and he said, Eric, I am so happy that I am 25 today and not 15. I said, tell me more. And for whatever reason, when he was a 15-year-old, he had this idealisation that he wanted to be a woman, and it was for about 18 months. And he just grew out of it, just grew out of it. And he says now 10 years fast forward, got no idea what motivated that, got no idea why I had this idealisation. But, of course, today, if you were to say to mum, dad and teachers, oh, wouldn't mind being a woman, chances are it would be straight into the hormone treatment and uh, surgery and whatever and affirmation of that which he wanted or he thought he wanted to be. And so... Um, you know, this so-called conversion therapy, I'm not sure that anybody actually practices conversion uh, therapy as being asserted, but people who are having difficulty do seek guidance. And once again, it's not a cookie-cutter approach, and there are some people that are genuinely helped in um, finding their way and... You know, it's now no longer politically correct to say so, but I'm still one of the old-fashioned people that believes in men and women and be it God-ordained or, for that matter, discard any form of religion and adopt evolution, propagation of the species being the big driver. Well, it's all about men and women coming together and propagating the uh, uh, next generation. So, um, yeah, there has to be, I think, some acceptance that there is a norm within society. And just because there is a norm, and, you know, the politically correct would be horrified to hear that heterosexuality is the norm, but just because something is the norm, as I believe it is, that is no excuse to then persecute, harass, or denigrate those that don't fit into the norm. And so that is where I think we need a balance within our community and uh, hopefully one day it will return. Yeah, I mean, it's a big concern not only for women's sport, which seems to just yes. be you know completely gone now uh, and uh, the level playing field is gone there, but also I think a real concern with people is parental rights. Um, that the transgender movement, if a, if a child, say the person you mentioned at 15, wanted to have a sex change and go into hormone therapy or even um, more significant surgery, that parents wouldn't be able to come in um, and in any way um, prevent or advise or counsel against that, again, under Daniel Andrews, um, I, th I think quite draconian legislation, they'd be prosecuted. Um, 
Is that something that you think um, the the Liberal government, how aware of that that um, danger do you think the government is? I think the government's aware of it, but um, at the moment within the Parliamentary Liberal Party, um, there are people who, like myself, would want to see legislation toughened up mm. in relation to religion, or re- religious freedom, and others who would want to see it watered down. And that is why I've been willing to adopt this watered down version, trusting it won't be watered down any further. We only have a very, very wafer thin margin in the House of Representatives, and all we need is one or two people to vote against the religious freedom legislation from my side of politics, and the bill may well be defeated. And so that is why trying to tread that middle course is so important, because my view is that something is better than nothing. But look, having said that, Mark, what government giveth, the government can take away. Mm. And so the idea that government is somehow legislating religious freedom is to me anathema to my whole approach to government. Um, These are, in my case, and your case, Mark, I'm sure you would agree, these are God-given rights. If you don't believe, that's fine, then they are rights that are enshrined in the United Nations declarations in bills of rights, etc., that are innate the right of every individual human being and it's not for governments to say you can have so much religious freedom or or, yeah we'll tweak it here or there depending on particular issues of the day so uh, it is very concerning that governments are taking on these uh, so-called rights um, and so trying to make themselves sound good by giving them rights uh, giving rights to people when they actually exist. They are our innate rights and government should not be interfering. But that said, given the host of other legislation that has interfered, we do need to uh, redress uh, that imbalance. Yeah, if I can, I was talking to a senior religious leader the other day and uh, about this religious freedom bill and uh, he said the problem is is that the discrimination laws have been weaponized by minority groups um, to effectively persecute and punish religious people and their um, religious convictions. Um, his solution was, why don't we just get rid of discrimination law discrimi- the, um, completely? How would you respond to that? Look, um, in my ideal world, yes, but um, politically in a democracy, can you imagine the outcry that we're getting rid of age discrimination, disability discrimination, sex discrimination. You see, my view is that in a, what, free world, in a free country, in a free society, people are allowed to make mistakes. People are allowed to engage in erroneous judgments. And uh, therefore, you know, way back, and uh, I think it's a shameful part of the Protestant um, heritage, but back in the Great Depression, uh, there were businesses that had signs outside, you know, vacancies, Catholics need not apply. Um, you know what? We overcame that as a society, not through legislation, but through, if you like, education and living with each other and uh, uh, some Protestants sort of realising that, you know what? Catholics are just as good a workers and chances are just as honest uh, with the same sort of work ethic as a Protestant. And uh, as a result, that is no longer a thing, as uh, is the common expression these days. It's no longer a thing in our society for you know, a uh, Protestant business person to say, uh, I don't want Catholics working for me. Mm-hmm. So uh, these things do tend to come out in the wash in society generally. And I think that's the best way to do it rather than try to force it. Because when you force things, let's say sex discrimination, churches that believe that only men can be uh, ministers or pastors, then they need an exemption. Then a gym that 
only wants to be for females also needs an exemption. Mm -hmm. And, you know, male clubs, female clubs, in a free democratic society, Mark, people should be able to make up their own minds and in due course these things evolve, I think, for the, for the betterment rather than through legislation. Okay. Now, uh, if I could ask you one final question, um, and I know this is an issue that's close to your heart, um, the Queen, because uh, you're, you're, you, you are very much a monarchist, um, mm. and uh, the Queen, um, as longest-serving monarch uh, in English history, um, there's going to come a day, tragically, where she will go to be with the Lord, because... Um, um, and then we'll have a change of monarch. It's a situation that's going to make a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Um, how would you respond? Uh, a lot of people are saying, look, they love the Queen, they love living in a constitutional monarchy. Um, not so keen about Prince Charles being the new monarch. Um, how would you respond uh, to that change in uh, government uh, figurehead? Look, uh, very good question. First of all, I am a constitutional monarchist mm. as opposed to just yeah, a sorry. monarchist, yep. which uh, is an important consideration. And so allow me to explain it this way. I am, if you like, a Democrat in the Australian body politic. I believe in our democracy. You know what? Our democracy has thrown up, um, without being too unkind, on my side of politics, a Prime Minister like Malcolm Turnbull, and on the Labor side, a Prime Minister like Kevin Rudd. Does that make me change my mind about our democratic structure? No, it doesn't. It is still a very good structure, despite who might get thrown up from time to time as our Prime Minister. Similarly, with a constitutional monarchy, I think Her Majesty has been an exemplar as how one ought to conduct oneself having the privilege of being the monarch because with that privilege come huge responsibilities. And uh, I think the Queen has done that exceptionally well. Remains to be seen how Prince Charles would behave in that role. Um, but the good news is, and I've got a picture of this, which provides great certainty for all of us. It's a picture of Her Majesty, of Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George. You know exactly what the lineage is going to be. And Her Majesty has been uh, the Queen from Robert Menzies as Prime Minister right through to modern day Scott Morrison. There's been this certainty, there's been this stability, there's been this, if you like, independent umpire, which is represented in our Governor General in Australian politics. And we do need somebody in our system that is genuinely above, above politics and willing to be the independent umpire. And if I may, Mark, in my office, I in fact have a picture of Sir John Kerr, who as Governor General had to make the tough decision of sacking Gough Whitlam, who had appointed him to the role of Governor, uh, to the role of Governor General. They shared chambers together as barristers. And, uh, yeah, we need somebody in our political system that is willing to take the oath of office and be absolutely independent. And if we were to have a president, like in the United States, good luck if you want that sort of a system. But as soon as you have a president, they will either be, one assumes, liberal or Labor, and therefore the independence in being the constitutional umpire, I think will be severely prejudiced. So look, mm -hmm. Prince Charles, take him or leave him, the actual institution of the constitutional monarchy is that which I support. And it stands to reason that from time to time, there'll be a really good monarch and other times not so good a monarch, but it's the system that I support. Yeah, great. Well, look, thanks so much again for joining us today, Eric. Um, I've really appreciated um, your answers, appreciate um, your involvement and in representing um, uh, us as a community and, uh, and I know as a Christian representing Christ um, uh, in, your, in your public service. So thank you. Mark, it's been a pleasure and thanks for having me. Great. Uh, well, this has been another episode of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode and I, lo and I hope to see you next time. Thanks very much.